and they dominated Europe for 300 years. They paid for Michelangelo's sculpture lessons, supported Leonardo da Vinci, and protected Galileo from the Inquisition, changing our vision of the heavens forever. But for over 300 years, they were a family with a dark side. Some were said to have murdered their wives, and some to have killed their sons. But is it true? Now we will have a chance to find out. Okay, I need everybody back, please. I'm part of an international team that for the first time has been given permission to open the crypt of the Medici and examine their remains. The stairs are fine. Coffins all around. Bones are on the floor. Using cutting-edge scientific techniques, we will finally unearth some of their secrets. The Medici are buried here, in the family chapel in the church of San Lorenzo in Florence. They hired Michelangelo to create these statues just for their tombs. And I think it's one of the most beautiful tombs in the world. But we're not here to admire Michelangelo's statues. We are going to examine the bodies of the Medici buried in the crypt beneath them. This is a project no one ever thought would happen. We have been given permission to exhume the bodies of the first family of Italy, the Medici. It's as if in America we were excavating the tombs of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and John F. Kennedy. And we've got 49 of them buried in this crypt. The only person in the world who could have pulled off this excavation is my friend, Professor Gino Fornaciari. I met Gino five years ago when he was examining the mummy of Beata Cristina of Spoleto, a holy woman who was embalmed by the sisters of her convent. Gino is Europe's leading paleopathologist, a master of diseases of the past. Is this the incision where they remove the organs? The thorax. My specialty is mummies, so Gino invited me to work with him. The, this individual was uh, very fat, very large. Right, yeah. very large. I mean, now, his dream of examining the Medici is about to come true. This is a skin here. And I will be assisting him. Isn't it surprising for a saint? Working in the crypt is strange. It's kind of like working in the Lincoln Memorial. It's hallowed ground. Tourists buy tickets and wander around, and we carry on our work right next to them. But I've got a bigger problem than dodging tourists. My job will be to open the tombs and determine if the bodies are in good enough condition to be studied. You know, we see this in, in, in embalming all the time in the ancient bodies. But I just thought, when I saw the, when I saw the um, plaster cast, yes. They had already been studying the... Donatella Lippi is the mighty mouse of the team a professor of medical history at the University of Florence and authority on the Medici. It's been so long since anyone has seen the bodies of the Medici that we don't know what we will find. No one's still alive who opened the crypt last time, and there are no detailed records of what they found. What worries me most is water. Normally, the Arno flows peacefully through Florence, but every few hundred years, it becomes a terror. And that's what happened in 1966. Florence was ravaged by a flood. And for 24 hours, the crypt was under five feet of water. This brown line isn't age. It's the high water mark in the crypt. And water isn't good for mummies. It can destroy soft tissue, and given enough time, it can even dissolve bones. And we don't know how much water seeped into the burials, or how long it stayed. We don't even know if there'll be anything left to work with. At the very okay, least, no, we'll need we bones. The only way to find out is to open the first tomb. We're starting with the big ones. Four bodies that could solve a 400-year-old murder mystery. A husband, wife, and two of their teenage sons. The father, Cosimo de' Medici, through a series of shrewd moves in 1540, 
had made himself absolute ruler of Florence, and he was looking for a wife. He married the 16-year-old daughter of the Viceroy of Naples. Eleonora was young, charming, and very rich. It was a politically smart marriage, like uniting the Kennedys and the Rockefellers. And like the Kennedys, a brief period in Camelot would end in tragedy. The tragedy that concerns us involves two of their sons. Supposedly, they quarreled on a hunting trip, and Garcia, the younger brother, stabbed and killed Giovanni. When Cosimo learned his favorite son had been killed, he flew into a rage, took his sword, and killed Garcia. But is it true? Our first tomb will be one of the sons, Giovanni. First, we have to remove the marble plaque on the floor that shows the burial spot. Then remove the body. But I'm not sure exactly how it's going to work. The thing is, you can't bring in heavy equipment because you can't have vibrations, you can't have anything that's they're doing it all by hand. But uh, it looks in pretty good shape. I'm, I'm kind of hoping that the, the water won't have gotten in. That's the big thing. The easiest part is removing the plaque. But there's bad news. This is unfortunately mud from the Arno River. This is when it overflowed in 1966. It's still a little bit moist, so water may be a problem, but we'll see. We're going to try to clear it all out. Underneath, it sounds like there's metal or something else. I'm not sure why. The grave seems to be filled with rubble. But then we hit another surprise. A large stone slab covering the burial chamber. No end, huh? You didn't find the end yet. The immediate problem is that it's longer than the space we've opened in the crypt floor. I don't see the end on either side. Yeah? No, he doesn't see the end. He doesn't see the end. It's not in. See here, maybe. We're going to have to remove some of the marble floor slabs. This will be tricky. I'm used to working in Egypt, where there's plenty of room and sand beneath you. Here, even the floor is an archaeological treasure. We decide to cut through the cement along the edge of the marble floor tile and then lift the tile so we can see just how big the stone slab is. After much discussion, we agree that our workmen, Franco and Paolo, need to build a superstructure to raise the slab with pulleys. They have the equipment, pulleys, pipes, chains, and they quickly assemble the rig. In a second, we'll know if we're in business or not. We're about to open the first tomb in the crypt of the famous Medici family, the tomb of young Giovanni de' Medici. As we lift the slab covering Giovanni's tomb, there's bad news. Mud. Will there be anything left for the team to examine? That's not the only question. Where's the coffin? There's only a small box. Not what we expected. Well, in the 1940s, some of the tombs were opened, but the excavators left no records. We have no idea what they did with the bodies. The small box must be how they reburied the bones. It looks like an ossuary, a container for bones. You can see a line on the bottom of the box where it was sitting in the water. Maybe the box protected the bones. Well, now's the time to find out. The old label is still legible. The bones of Cardinal Giovanni, son of Cosimo I. Our first Medici, Giovanni, was a favorite son. The Pope made him cardinal at the age of 17. You don't find any teenage cardinals today. But he died at 19, and for 400 years, there were rumors that he was murdered by his brother. Will his bones tell us anything? Hopefully our research will be able to settle the murder theory once and for all. It's wet on the bottom. As I lift the box with Antonio, our yeah. archaeologist, yeah. I can feel water on the bottom. But the box isn't rusted. Okay. We okay. have a chance. A vitamin just fell out of my pocket. I don't want to confuse anybody here. It's a vitamin. Yeah. Yeah. Down. 
Antonio, it's wet, huh? Yeah. There's a lot of water. Yeah, very wet. Um, but we'll see. The whole project depends on what's in this box, but we can't open it here. The team has set up a field laboratory in a side room of the crypt beside the chapel. The chapel is a major tourist destination, and our lab is just a few yards from where visitors stare at the treasures of the Medici. When the Medici tombs are opened, we bring the remains here to be examined. We determine their condition and what conservation they will need and see what we can learn from the bodies. If the bones have dissolved, the whole project could end here. There's bones. There's bones. Yeah, no. Some mud. Some mud, but it's okay. There are also softies. Yeah? Yeah, I can't see. All right, we'll open. Okay. Okay. We'll open. We're going to take the whole thing off. This is the first time anyone has been face to face with a Medici in a long time. The bones have a strange coating on them. Is it mud? Textile. Se dice textile? 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 Stoffa. Yeah. No, we're okay. It's disintegrated linen that once covered the bones. Gina will have something to work with and is very relieved. Good. Yes, it's one they can work with, right? Finally, we may be able to determine if Giovanni was murdered. Bravo. <laughs> Crucial to solving the mystery is Gino's team of physical anthropologists, bone experts from the University of Pisa. They are the Charlie's Angels of Skeletons and are used to such missions. They can articulate skeletons very quickly. Okay, not that quickly. It took them 15 minutes. The label on the box says it's Giovanni, but are they really his bones? The good news is we have a nearly complete skeleton and it's in good condition. The next step is to see if it's really our man, the 19-year-old cardinal. Look at the teeth. They're a good indicator of age. Now, this is a molar. They come in around 21 years old or so. This one's in. But the other one isn't in. If you look closely here, you can see it's coming in at an angle. That means he's probably not 21. He's younger, just about 19, which is the right age for our cardinal. But let me show you something else. If you can come over here, Julio, you can see this is the pelvis. And this is the top called the iliac crest. That usually fuses around the age of 21 or so. It's cartilage in the beginning, and then it becomes bone. But you can see it's not fused. So he's, again, younger than 21, probably around 19. There's another indication we've got the right body. Look over here, this bone. Now, we know that the cardinal was a sportsman. He liked hunting, so he's an athlete. This is a robust bone. It's a sign that he had muscle. As your muscles grow, the bone thickens. So I'm pretty sure we've got the right man. Now, it's a really good condition skeleton, but he wasn't in perfect condition. Let me show you one other thing about the teeth. Now, if you can come over here, come around, and I want to show you this tooth over here. You can see the roots of the tooth are exposed. That's a massive infection. Now, in Renaissance times, an infection like that could kill you. There were no antibiotics. But I don't really think that's what killed him. Remember, some people think he was stabbed to death. The first place to look for evidence is the chest. But something's missing. This is the sternum. But one bone that's missing is the manubrium, which is right on top of it. And it's just the place where if someone going to stab you, you were vulnerable. But don't jump to conclusions. We have a lot of research to do, and it may not be the way he was killed. Once Gino's angels have cleaned the bones and articulated the skeleton, their work has just begun. Every bone must be measured, described, and photographed. 
Soon the Medici must be reburied, and the angels are responsible for assembling the most complete physical record ever made of a single family. Their records may contain the clues that will tell us if murder was involved. From their measurements of the long bones, they will calculate the height of the Medici. They will determine dental health and bone density. From their records, the Medici will live again. But that's not all. Marcello, Gino's assistant, takes bone samples for Gino's lab in Pisa. DNA will be extracted, providing a genetic record of the most important family in history. Working in the Medici Chapel has all kinds of perks. You get to see neat things off limits to tourists. Let me show you the most valuable graffiti in the world. Of all the artists supported by the Medici, perhaps the greatest was Michelangelo. At one time during a war, Michelangelo had to hide for a couple of weeks here in a secret room off the Medici crypt. This is how he described it. I hid in a tiny cell, entombed like the dead Medici above. To forget my fears, I filled the walls with drawings. An incredible hidden treasure. But now, back to the murder theory. Let's summarize. Remember Giovanni? Iliac crest, unfused. Right age for victim. Massive dental infection, not cause of death. Manubrium on top of sternum missing. Likely spot for stabbing, but not proof of murder. We take this up first. This comes up first. If we are ever going to find out if Giovanni was murdered, the next body to examine is the younger brother, Garcia. Remember, the poor kid was supposedly killed by his enraged father, but he's also our prime suspect as a murderer. The Medici family may have had a dark side. Was murder really involved in the death of young Giovanni de' Medici? Our exhumation of the family crypt may finally provide answers. We're on the trail of Garcia, the suspected murderer. We have now we just have to open his grave. This excavation is front page news in Italy, and everybody who works in the crypt wants to see what's happening. It's standing room only. There's more mud at the bottom, is the thing. You want some mud? Thanks. Oh. Yeah. Come on in. Here it is. Bossa. The bones of, right? Also bones. Cosimo. So it's going to be the son of. Field. Son, son of, of son of Cosimo, Garcia, you think? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Ossa Garcia de Medici Cosmi, primi figli. Yeah, the bones of Garcia, the son of Cosimo the first. So at least we have the right guy. Yeah. Now, yeah, keep it level. Yeah. All right. Good. Keep going. Once the bones are in the field laboratory, Gino's team goes to work, removing the bones from the ossuary. That's strange. There's a piece of velvet fabric in with the bones. We photograph it, just in case it's important. Again, it looks like the bones are in pretty good condition they should be able to tell us more about the murders. If you counted the bones on this table, there'd be more than the normal 206. That's because Garcia was only 16 when he died. Remember our cardinal? Remember we looked at the pelvis bone and it hadn't fused because he was young? Well, because Garcia is only 16, most of his bones are separated. Look over here. These aren't two separate bones. This is the top of this one. But over the centuries, they've separated. 
Okay, that's your anatomy lesson for today. Now, what about the murder theory? Well, remember, supposedly Garcia was run in by his father's sword? Look carefully at these bones. If a sword really went into his body, there'd be cut marks, maybe around the vertebra, the ribs, the sternum, but they're absolutely clean. There's no evidence of violence. My bet is that the murder theory is just a myth. There's no doubt the brothers died within weeks of each other. But there's got to be some explanation other than a bloody stabbing. So how did they die? Perhaps there's a way to find out. Our radiologist, Dr. Villari, is pleased with his 400-year-old patient. It's something different. Every possible medical technology will be applied to these bones to see what they will reveal. The x-rays are absolutely beautiful. But something's wrong. Look closely. Can you see what doesn't belong? It's a tooth lodged in the skull. That's post-mortem. It fell out after death when the body was reduced to just bones. Later, when Garcia was reburied, it fell into the skull. Donatella's archive research reveals that Garcia was ill several times during his childhood. Some episodes of illness leave their marks in the bones. See those thin horizontal white lines? Each one marks an illness. They're called growth arrest lines. When you're sick, you stop growing. The body uses your nutrients to fight off the illness. The technique is kind of like reading tree rings. The spacing of the lines can tell us when Garcia was sick. Calculations show he was sick starting at the age of two, and then four more times before he was ten. He was chronically ill as a child, but that doesn't tell us what killed him. So how did the brothers die? Were they really murdered? Garcia, ribs, no cut marks, sternum, no signs of violence, not run through with a sword, Giovanni, missing manubrium, but no real signs of violence, not stabbed to death, conclusion, no physical evidence of murder. So what killed them? A crucial clue may be in a letter. The family physician advised Cosimo not to take the boys to Morema, where malaria was raging. Cosimo didn't listen. On November 20th, 1562, he wrote to another son. On the 15th, Giovanni suffered from a high fever, but became worse and died. Could it be that malaria, not murder, is the cause of death? That's exactly what the team expects to find through medical testing of their remains. But medical testing isn't our only interest. As our investigation proceeds, we're building a profile of the brothers. But let me show you something about their daily life. Remember our small fragment of textile we discovered in Garcia's coffin? It's quite distinctive. And you won't believe what we found in the Florence Costume Museum. This is the Medici room, and this is the case for Don Garcia. That garment, I'm, I'm no fashion expert, but I think it's gonna match our cloth. Oh, take a look. Come close, there it is. Now, the garment looks pretty much complete. Uh, there it is, you see it right by the leg? There's a missing piece where it's been restored. And this goes right there. We got a match. This is the outfit Don Garcia was buried in. Remember the 1940s excavators who put the bones in the little boxes? They removed his clothes, but missed the velvet fragment. Later, when they found it, they threw it in the box with the bones. We have to contend with the remnants of the mysterious 1940s excavation. More than 50 years ago, some of the Medici tombs were opened by anthropologists with no archaeological training. They made quite a mess of things and never published their findings. 
The curator of the Anthropological Museum knows all about the mysterious excavation. She has all they left behind, plaster casts of the skulls of the Medici. They had some misguided theory that by studying the cranial capacity of the skulls, they could explain the Medici genius. Let me show you something curious about the work of the 1940s excavators. You know what we found when, when, we, when I was looking at the skull? Small cut marks on the skulls, sometimes around the mandible. I think in 1947, 1948, they had flesh on them still. They were mummies. And I think they wanted to get at the, at the skull, and they took the flesh off with a knife. I, I think it was, a, it was a period maybe when they were interested mainly in the skull. You know, in the early days of physical anthropology, it was only the skull that they wanted. And I think that's what they went after. The next Medici we'll exhume is Eleonora, Giovanni and Garcia's mother. She married Cosimo de' Medici when she was a teenager. But she came with a fortune of her own. She was smart, energetic, independent, and a devoted mother to all her children. Just look at her private chapel in the Palazzo Vecchio. It's covered with paintings of children. See the face of the Madonna? That's her daughter, Maria. And when the rooms in the palace became too small and cramped for her children to play in, she did what any millionaire mother would do. She moved to the suburbs and renovated a huge palace. There, her kids could play in the gardens in freedom. But in the end, she died at the age of 40, six days after her son Garcia, supposedly from a broken heart. Will her remains reveal the true cause of her death? This is the first time an international team has been given permission to open the crypt of the Medici. We've opened the tombs of the two brothers and are about to excavate the tomb of their mother, Eleonora. We feel more confident. We think we know just how to do it. Soon we will find out how very wrong we are. There's a surprise. There are bones on the top of the grave. Uh, so we've got to go very slowly and try to recover everything. Filangi, huh? <laughs> Filangi. It's a piece of wood. Yeah, it's Antonio, can you work, work there? Look there. Um, and Antonella, over there. Everything slows maybe, down. You work there with we must sift through rubble to find any other bones. Gino's team is used to identifying bones, and they find several more. She's great. Yes. So some are from the hands, some are from the foot. The mano de pied. Yeah. Tutte humano? Tutte humano? Yeah, they're all human, yeah. Then we find a rib. Is there an entire body? No, just one rib. More evidence of the 1940s excavators. They had some extra Medici bones, so they just chucked them in the rubble. It's slow going, but finally we clear the rubble and get to the level of the stone slab. But again, there's a surprise. It's completely different. There's not one slab, there's three. When we try to lift the middle slab, we find that the three slabs are carved so the edges interlock. You can't just lift the middle one. It's an anti-theft device. It's causing us problems, but we all appreciate the design. Franco and Paolo start removing more floor tiles to get to the third slab. Why the special protection? What's Manipulate underneath? By hand. Yes. Okay. The third slab finally comes up, and we find the familiar yes. mud from the Arno River flood of 1966. Lots of mud, but we've seen that before. Well. Ah, see. See? See, do it. As we peer into the tomb, we can see another box. It's not just Eleanor in there. Do a coffin. See? Yeah. This is the ever changing excavation. See the other one? Yeah. We're okay. They must have buried her husband, Cosimo, with her. By now, everyone knows the drill. 
The stretcher is brought, the box removed to the field laboratory, and then Eleonora's box is removed. Why is her box larger and heavier than her husband's? Very different. It's, it's not in a jumble. It's not, it's the cranium and the mandible are separate. Yeah. And it's as if it's in place carefully. The other ones were just sort of yes. piled in. The answer is, she had the deluxe model ossuary. There's a special compartment for the cranium and a separate one for the other bones. Slowly. Um, yes. I like the idea that she had the Zippius box. It's okay. Eleonora was into style. Her dresses were made of the finest fabrics and in the latest fashion. When she commissioned the artist, Bronzino, to paint her portrait, he was paid well. But the seamstress who designed the dress was paid just as much as the artist. Eleonora loved wearable art. Eleonora's bones are in good condition. And I think they will tell us more about this amazing woman. Meet Eleonora. She was small, but tough. Let me show you how small. This is the femur. It's the longest bone in your body, and hers isn't much bigger than my hand. She was definitely under five feet tall. But now let me tell you about tough. Remember I said she had lots of children? Well, Eleonora gave birth at the age of 18, and 19, and 20, and 21. Then she had more children at 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, and she wasn't done. She had two more children at the age of 31 and 32. Now, if you're counting, that's 11 children in 14 years. Every time you give birth, it's traumatic for your pelvis. And let me show you Eleonora's pelvis. It's over here. Now, this part of the pelvis, if you can come in really close, this part of the pelvis is called a pubic synthesis. And this isn't the way nature made it. It's rough. It's irregular. Every time she had a child, it chipped away a little bit of the bone, and then she regrew it. Another child regrew some more bone, and that's why it's shaped like that. Now, over here, you're going to need a different angle to see this, but this is her sacrum. Now, originally, it's angular, but you can see it's been flattened out by all those children coming down the birth canal. It's deformed. That was the effect of having 11 children. Eleanor was tough, but she died fairly young, around the age of 40, and the team is going to try to figure out exactly what killed her. One of the clues to her death may be in her portraits. She looks healthy in this early portrait with Giovanni. Now look at one painted during her last year. See how much thinner? Look at her complexion, how pale she is. We know from the historical records that she'd been coughing and spitting up blood. It could be tuberculosis. After the deaths of his beloved wife and sons, Cosimo withdrew from public life. One of the most famous sites in Florence may be due to Cosimo's loss. He had the great architect, Vasari, design a corridor running above the streets of Florence. Now Cosimo could walk in seclusion, unseen, above the streets he once walked with Eleonora. The corridor goes right over the Ponte Vecchio, where today tourists shop for gold. But it wasn't always like that. When the corridor was built, there were butcher shops below. But Cosimo didn't like the smell, so he had them replaced with goldsmith shops. I don't think Cosimo ever recovered from the deaths of his sons Giovanni and Garcia and his wife Eleonora all within a month. He must have felt incredibly guilty. He had been warned not to take the children to an area where malaria was raging. And now they were dead. Today, the passageway holds a fabulous art collection. But originally, it was designed to isolate Cosimo from the world. Cosimo lived for another decade, eventually dying from a series of strokes. So for poor Cosimo, we don't have to examine his remains for evidence of murder. But his skull gives us the biggest shock of all. The Medici were the most powerful family in the world, 
And our exhumation of the family crypt has just revealed another secret. I want to show you something unique about Cosimo's skull. Look inside. You can see the skull is in two parts. Let me try to take it out. There. Now, this is an early attempt at embalming. They were trying to mummify Cosimo. You can see it's pretty crude. They hacked away here, didn't work, tried another one here. Finally, they got the top of the skull out. They were removing the brain. They knew that to preserve the body, you had to get rid of the moist brain or bacteria would act on it. But these guys weren't as skilled as the ancient Egyptian embalmers, and all we're left with is a box of bones. It's been an amazing day. Two Medici, Eleonora and Cosimo, for the price of one, and everyone's happy, especially Gino's angels. Our anthropologists have 412 bones to work with, and the bones can tell us quite a bit about Cosimo. Shoulder blades, asymmetrical, right considerably larger, Cosimo was right-handed. Femur, protuberance on leg bone, result of regular horseback riding. Arm bones, robust, Cosimo was a weightlifter. Spine, three fused vertebra, suffered from dish, diffused idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, difficulty bending in old age. Well, dead men can tell tales, and Cosimo's skeleton tells us a lot. He was strong, athletic, full of energy, but in the end, racked with pain. But he was a man of intellect as well. Remember, Cosimo was one of the Medici greats. Let me show you just how great. Just next door to the chapel, the Medici created something that put them apart from all other rulers of Europe. These stairs, the facade, all designed by Michelangelo. And they lead to something very special. It's a library. Incredible, isn't it? And Cosimo opened it up to the public. All the details, the bookshelves, the benches, the height of the reading table, were designed by Michelangelo. Let me show you how it worked. Books were arranged according to categories. Here's the heading, Latin texts, and here are the books. It's a card catalog. You'd find your spot, you'd sit down, and take your book. See this chain? The books and manuscripts in this library were precious. This isn't a printed book, it's a manuscript. And at the bottom of the first page is the crest of the family that commissioned it the Medici. Cosimo was a fanatic collector, and books were his passion, especially ancient books. He was searching for the wisdom of the past. In this library, ideas that changed the world were studied and launched. This may have been the single greatest contribution of the Medici, and Cosimo was in the middle of it all. Cosimo's children continued to support the arts and sciences. When Cosimo's grandson needed a tutor, the Medici hired the best, Galileo. The Galileo. Galileo is famous for his Leaning Tower of Pisa experiment. Historians are still debating whether he actually dropped the ball from the tower, but he did explain to the world that in a vacuum, heavy and light objects fall at the same rate. 400 years later, the experiment was performed on the moon. But Galileo lived in changing times, when science and religion seemed opposed. And if you were on the wrong side, science, you could be burned at the stake. This is the world Galileo blew away, the universal machine. It's a model that shows the Earth at the center of the universe. That's what people believed for thousands of years before Galileo. Galileo taught that the sun was at the center of the universe. And because this was against the teachings of the church, he was summoned to Rome by the Inquisition. 
His life was spared, probably because of his Medici connection. But all good things must come to an end. And John Gastoni, the last Medici, marks the end of our powerful family. His last official act was to rebury Galileo in the church of Santa Croce more than a century after his death. This is where Michelangelo lies. And now, thanks to John Gastoni, so does Galileo. But not all of Galileo is in his tomb. This is his finger. When John Gastoni reburied Galileo, they took a souvenir, his finger, and placed it in the Science Museum. John Gastoni died in 1737, and his grave is the last one we will exhume this season. John Gastoni's tomb is different from the others. It's in another part of the crypt. Gastoni was buried with two 12-inch gold medals and a jewel-encrusted crown and scepter. And this tomb should be undisturbed. Everyone is very excited. The reporters have gold fever. They're hoping for another two tank almond. We know we will have to deal with the effects of the 1966 flood. But still, it could be fabulous. It's dry. You know, it's dry. We've got a chance that it's in good condition. I, I think I think there's a chance it's in good condition. It's dry, it's not as wet as the other one. Uh, this looks like flood stuff, but I, I think we're okay. We think the excavation should be the same as the other tombs. Pick up the marble flooring, lift the huge stone slab or two, and we'll have our Medici. Boy, were we wrong. And this time, it's a real problem. No stone slab. Just solid concrete and stone. And there's no sign of any tomb. So this is different. This is very different. I'm not sure what we have, so we drill a core sample. The stone is very hard. You can't just go straight through it. These guys, they're, they're a little bit excited. I'm trying to slow them down. It's hard. Yeah, they want to go down. You can't do it. You can't do it. We just might be standing on top of a huge underground tomb. This is really different and I'm not sure exactly where John Gastoni is. We lift more paving stones, but still the same concrete and stone. Is this an extra layer to protect the crown and gold medals? The early records don't help us. Lots of references to gold, but no details of the burial. There's one last chance. There's a curious circular paving stone. You know how in the last Indiana Jones film, an X on the floor marked the spot? Maybe a circle marks John Gastoni's spot. We can lift this, that's okay. We lift this, we look. But if the stones are the same as that, it's over. But we can see, and then we put it back, and that's it. So let's try one last thing. This is our make or break point. Excavating in the Medici crypt has been incredible, but so far, all the graves our international team exhumed have been disturbed. There's more mud at the but now we're after the big one, the intact tomb of the last Medici, John Gastoni. But so far, we've been unable to find him. This is our last chance to find Gastoni, but I think I've got him. There's something different, a layer of clean sand. It has a ring, it'll come up, but what's underneath it is uh, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. And under the sand is a stone plug. I need everybody back, please. Here we go. Stairs. Get it out. Get it out. I need a light. I need a light down here. And they lead to a huge underground crypt. I think I can see John Gastoni's coffin. I know he was buried in a lead coffin. And I can see a lead one inside a badly damaged wood coffin. Okay. But I can't go in yet. The Italians are worried about microbes in the tomb. So I put on a biohazard suit. Yes. I'm more worried about the structural strength of the stairs. 
It seems fine. Missed a second. Still good. You need a little light. Light? Yes, better. Good. This is good. Okay, just a second. More light down here. More light. Um, okay. Now, the stairs are fine. What I can see, there are, there are, there are coffins all around. The bones are on the floor. We'll have to go very slowly to reconstruct what happened. And I think we'll probably even need a wood conservator to work on the coffins. So if the tomb has been robbed, or it's, it's not in the condition we hoped, but I think it'll be interesting. There's, there's plenty of human remains that we can work with. Um, in terms of artifacts, I don't think we'll have very much because they took it. I wonder if uh, uh, the medals, which were buried together with... Gone, the for sure. I don't know, maybe melted down. The thieves aren't going to sell it as art because they'll know it's stolen. I think it's melted down. Too simple. Sure. So the crypt was robbed, but when? Well, it had to be before 1966, the year of the flood. The entire tomb, stairs, coffins, are covered with undisturbed mud. My bet is it's like in ancient Egypt. The workers who did the burying did the robbing. They knew just how to get in, and the golden jewels were too much temptation. What you can see is the lid has fallen in on top. This is the lid of the lead coffin, which was inside the wooden coffin. So when the thieves went at it, they pulled off the lead lid, they pulled off the wooden lid, and then they just threw it back in. There is a rib right over there. And I'm pretty sure it would have to be John Gastoni's because almost certainly they're not going to mix up bones. They're just going to throw them out, take whatever they can. There, there's also some small coffins. There's a coffin in there in the corner that's disturbed also. And behind me, there are several coffins. What you've got in here is a young child. I, I think it's a girl. You can see the mandible. And it's probably maybe four years old, maybe five. And she's still got her dress on. So the costume will be very important, I think. So this was a fairly large crypt that was made for the last Medici and other, other children that are, that are unknown. These are the remains of the last Medici, children and adults together in battered coffins, a sad end to a noble family. But perhaps it's not the end. With their skills, Gino and his team will undoubtedly coax more Medici secrets from these long, silent bones. Cosimo and Eleonora have already yielded some of their secrets. We've learned a lot about their medical history, but perhaps more important, we've cleared their names. This wasn't a family of murderers. They were a loving, caring family that suffered a terrible tragedy. The brothers died of natural causes, malaria, and we've helped rewrite this little slice of history. I've worked with human remains all over the world, and sometimes I wonder if I'm doing the right thing, disturbing the tombs of the dead. But as we rebury Cosimo and Eleonora in their new coffins, I have no doubt that they would approve. The Medici were on the cutting edge of science. They supported Galileo. They made sure that the great anatomist, Versalius, had cadavers for his studies. If the team's study of disease of the Medici helps save lives in the future, I think Cosimo Eleonora would be very pleased indeed. <laughs>